Welcome back to Pentagram Prime, everyone. The timestamps listed here will take you where you need to go, and I'd like to pause for a brief channel update. I finally deleted a video. Yes, I know, it's hard to believe. I don't wish to dwell on it, but the video did not fit the direction that I wish to take the channel in, and it was time for a change. We will, again, be discussing the calculation of residues, which manifest themselves both in the coefficient of the 1 over z term in the Lorentz series, as well as that of an integral taken along a closed loop in the complex plane. In the last episode, we calculated residues by first calculating the Lorentz series for the function at the requested point. This can be both difficult and time consuming. So in this episode, we will explore techniques that do not specifically require the calculation of ORN series. The order of a given complex function with respect to a given variable will be particularly important in this episode. So I would like to take a moment to discuss what a zero is in this context. Let us express an analytic function f of z in the complex plane as a Taylor series centered about c. If all of the coefficients are zero, and by that I mean all of the derivatives of f evaluated at c, including the zeroth derivative, which is just the function f of c, then the function is equal to zero everywhere within the domain of the Taylor series. Otherwise, at least one of these coefficients is non-zero, corresponds to the nth derivative of the function f evaluated at c, and only one of these coefficients can have the smallest value of n in the Taylor series. In the case where the smallest non-zero coefficient corresponds to that of an n value of 1 or higher, we say that the function f of z has a zero of order n at c. Just to be clear, in the case of an analytic function with an nth order zero, all of the coefficients in the corresponding Taylor series with lower order derivatives will be zero, including the constant f of c. Part a. Here we seek the residue of the function f of z equal to e to the z minus one over the sine of z at z naught equal to zero. The numerator, which we'll call g of z, has a first order zero at z naught. This can be seen by first calculating g of z naught, which turns out to be zero, and then calculating g prime of z naught, which is one. The fact that g of z naught is zero and g prime of z naught is non-zero indicates that g of z has a first order zero at z naught. The denominator, which we'll call h of z, also has a first order zero at z naught. As with g of z, we can see the evidence of a first order zero in h of z by first calculating h of z naught, which is zero, and then calculating h prime of z naught, which is one. The non-zero prime combined with the zero in the original function indicates that h of z has a first order zero at z naught. Both the numerator and denominator have zeros of the same order at z naught. This indicates a removable singularity according to proposition 4.11. Thus, all coefficients in the principal part of the Lorentz series of f of z centered at z naught are zero, and thus so is the residue of f of z at z naught. Part B. I told you all in the last video that I'm fallible, and Part B is unfortunately no exception. I wrote, shot, and edited this part only to realize afterwards that there was an easier method for procuring the residue in question. It's shown in Proposition 412 on page 244, and while I did have fun pointing out what I still believe is an error in the text on page 250, it is important that I state here and now that there is a better way than what I originally used. So what I'm going to do is show you what I originally wrote for Part B, which is based on a paragraph regarding simple poles on 244. After that, I will show the methodology in Proposition 412, which is also located on page 244, immediately following the paragraph on simple poles. That same methodology is listed 
in function number 4 on page 250 in table 411. While the methods do have similarities, I feel it is important to be explicit about the differences. The timestamps for both methods will be listed at the beginning of this video. Here we seek the residue of 1 over e to the z minus 1 at z not equal to 0. But hold that thought because I want to talk about something else. Let's take another look at that table we saw in part A. It's on page 250 of Mars and Hoffman. And if we look at function number 3, we see that the limit described in the test is equal to 0. But we also see here that the limit is supposed to be non-zero. Then, if we go to page 244 and look at the section on simple poles, we see that for this class of function, the same limit we saw in table 411 is required to both exist and to be non-zero in order for us to use the limit to calculate the residue of f of z at z naught. Am I missing something here? I'm not here to gloat, I just want to make sure that I was upfront about the migraine that I got as I second-guessed myself while reading the text. I'm guessing that the zero shown in function number 3 of table 411 is a typo. Anyway, for part B, we will be using the principles laid out in the text for simple poles, while ignoring that presumably misplaced zero. Marsden Hoffman, if you're watching this and I'm out of line, then my comment section is at your disposal. It is important that I point out that there can be a certain amount of guesswork in these problems, especially if you are unsure of the order of the functions involved. Lucky for us, we established that e to the z minus 1 has a first order 0 at z not equal to 0 when we worked on it in part a. Since f of z currently has that function in its denominator, the presence of a simple pole at z not equal to 0 is a good bet. As discussed, the strategy for calculating the residue of a function with a simple pole at z0 is summed up near the bottom of page 244. Here we are advised that if the limit of f of z times z minus z0 as z approaches z0 exists and is non-zero, then this limit is equal to the residue of f of z at z0. So let us take this limit and grind out an answer. Z minus Z naught in the numerator becomes Z, and we have a good setup for the application of L'Hopital's rule. Derivatives run their course, and we are left with e to the Z in the denominator, which becomes e to the nothing. 1 over 1 is 1, and that's the residue for 1 over e to the Z minus 1 at Z naught equal to 0. For Proposition 412 to be applicable, it asks that f of z be broken up into two parts, g of z in the numerator and h of z in the denominator, and both of these must be analytic at z naught. Since g of z is equal to 1 for all values of z, it satisfies this requirement, and since h of z is equal to 0 at z naught, it also satisfies this requirement. Furthermore, for Proposition 412 to apply, h prime of z naught must be non-zero, which it is. So with <coughs> the requirements for g of z, h of z, and h prime of z satisfied, we now know that f of z has a simple pole at z naught, and that the residue for f of z at z naught is equal to g of z naught divided by h prime of z naught. This gives us the same answer we discussed before where we explicitly evaluated a limit. I should point out that if you look at the definition of a derivative as applied to h prime of z naught, then you can see how one method gives rise to the other. A proof of this is shown on page 245 of the text. Part C. Here we seek the residue of z plus 2 over z squared minus 2z at z naught equal to 0. If we break f of z into g of z and h of z, as we did for part b, then we see that both g and h are analytic at z naught. If we take the derivative of h of z and evaluate it at z naught, then we see that it is non-zero and that f of z meets the requirements for proposition 412, which we used in part b. 
plugging in the values of g of z naught and h prime of z naught into the formula listed in prop 412, we get negative 1 for the residue of f of z at z naught, and we can all move on to bigger and better things. Part D. Here we seek the residue of 1 plus e to the z divided by z to the fourth at z naught equal to 0. If we again break f of z into g of z and h of z, then we see that both g and h are analytic at z naught and that g of z naught is non-zero. If we turn to page 249 and look at proposition 417, we see a method for evaluating a residue where h of z naught along with multiple derivatives of h of z evaluated at z naught are zero. Looks like a good bet, so let's crunch some derivatives. Since the fourth derivative of h of z is equal to 24, and thus non-zero for all values of z in the complex plane, including z naught, we see that proposition 417 is appropriate for calculating the residue that we are seeking. Also, going forward, it is important to be aware that for the purposes of this solution, k is equal to 4. So now we get to calculate this behemoth. If you only read far enough to say what the hell is that thing, then you might be wondering, how do I determine what the dimensions are for this matrix that I'm supposed to be working with? I don't always suggest blatantly skipping the formulas, but here we may want to momentarily scroll down to where you see that it's supposed to be a k by k matrix. In our case, this means 4 by 4. Focusing back on the formulas, we see that we will be calculating a coefficient multiplied times the determinant of the aforementioned k by k matrix. Try to remember that the column on the far right is how we will be calculating the fourth column of the matrix in question. The first time I set this up, I was uh, getting the idea in my head that all of the terms in the fourth column except for the one at the bottom were zero. And that's not the first time I was dead wrong. Hopefully somebody benefits by me pointing that out. So setting up the formulas for the residue, still in terms of k, but with a 4 by 4 matrix this time, we see that we already have the values we need for three of the terms along the diagonal, since we calculated them earlier. Looking below the diagonal, we see that all of the derivatives required are of h and are of a degree greater than k. If we consider that we have already shown that the fourth derivative of h of z is a constant, then we can see that the fifth, sixth, and seventh are zero for all values of z, including z naught. Finally, we get to the column on the far right. Here we are required to calculate g of z naught along with the first three derivatives of g of z evaluated at z naught before inserting these values into their respective positions in the column. Carrying out some arithmetic eliminates the coefficient on the left-hand side, and what we are left with is a slightly less intimidating determinant than th what we just saw on page 250. A trip to wolframalpha.com does the matrix algebra for us, and we can return to Google News as we listen for updates about the outbreak of World War III. Nah, you know me. This is Pentagram Prime. We'd never let a perfectly good matrix go to waste. Part E. 
Last but not least, we seek the residue of f of z equal to e to the z divided by c squared minus 1 to the second power at z naught equal to 1. On the surface, this looks like we should be able to use the same methodology as we did for part d. The denominator is, as before, a fourth order function with a 0 at z naught. But as we will see shortly, it pays to read the text carefully here. Let us begin by separating the top and bottom into functions g and h like we did for parts c and d. And since none of us would be here if we didn't love taking derivatives, let's calculate the first four derivatives of both g and h before evaluating them at z naught. The function h of z is, after all, a fourth order polynomial. g of z doesn't tend to do much when you apply a derivative to it, so there's not much to see here. g of z naught is equal to e, as are all of its derivatives when evaluated at z naught. But if we look at the second derivative of h of z, we notice that when evaluated at z naught, it produces a non-zero value. Looking again at proposition 417, we see that for it to apply to a case with a value of k equal to 4, it is not enough for h of z naught to be 0. For Prop 417 to work, the first three derivatives of h of z evaluated at z naught must also be 0. The fact that the second derivative equals 8 when evaluated at z naught is a deal breaker, and we need to find another way. I suspect that the method in proposition 417 may work if set up with k equals 2. May work. I didn't see any explicit limits on values of k in the text, but I also didn't bother going down that rabbit hole because I already blew the production budget, i.e. my time, on making jokes about the Russian president. Feel free to try it out, and please do so at your own risk. I already found an easier way on page 247. Proposition 414 requires that g of z naught be non-zero, h of z naught be equal to zero, h prime of z naught also be equal to zero, and h double prime of z naught be non-zero, which is perfect for us. The residue, as described here, fits into a nice little package that is dependent upon, among other things, the first three derivatives of h of z evaluated at z naught. Sorry, some of you will rightfully say that I made you calculate that fourth derivative for nothing. Plug and Chug is going to take us out on this, the 60th episode of Pentagram Prime, and we can now see that the residue of e to the z divided by z squared minus 1 to the second power evaluated at z naught equals one big fat zero, and I hope you score higher than that on your next exam. Till next time, this is Pentagram Prime signing off. What happened? Someone set up us the bond. We get signal. What? Main screen turn on. It's you. How are you gentlemen? All your base are belong to us. You are on the way to destruction. What you say? You have no chance to survive, make your time. Ha ha ha.